everyone. Welcome to the closing plen uh, plenary. And we'll be waiting for a few more people to join in. And we'll start shortly. In the meantime, you can introduce yourself on the chat. Feel free to introduce yourself on the chat. Welcome uh, for the uh, for the people who recently joined. You can introduce yourself on the chat, and we will start shortly. Hello everyone, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, where, wherever you are. And welcome to the closing planner, uh, plenary of CBO 16, Local Solution Inspiring Global Action. Uh, this year we had two days of CBA. Yesterday we started the CBA and today we are closing it off. And I, I, I want to welcome you all on this uh, closing uh, plenary. Hope you had an interesting uh, CBA. Uh, and we want to take forward your messages and your uh, feedback and response from this year's CBA. Let me, okay. Uh, the objective of this uh, CBA closing plenary will be opportunities to share about what next for the CBA. Uh, the opportunities that are the, that are arising uh, for all of you to be sharing about and what what is the next on CBAs. We will be collecting your message for COP27 and we'll be reflecting on the highlights that what we have learned. Uh, I request you to make this a very interactive event like yesterday's opening plenary. Uh, your participation is highly requested, appreciated. And then we, we will have a panel discussion on reflecting on CBA's message and how we want to take it forward. Starting with the opportunities, 
uh, I would like to give the floor to Amil from uh, Amil. Are you there to share yeah. the opportunities we have? Great, thanks so much, Sushila. <clears throat> thanks, great. So the Resilience Knowledge Coalition, which is co-led by the Global Resilience Partnership, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and the Climate Development Knowledge Network, has two opportunities that I think many of you will be interested in. Uh, the first is a social media contest ahead of COP27. And the intention uh, for this is for you to uh, share depictions on social media, et cetera, of what your community is doing to tackle the impacts of climate change. Uh, your entry stands a chance to win uh, a cash award of a thousand US dollars. Uh, we'll be sharing the links to all of these in the chat. So you'll be able to click on them and access further information. The social media contest will be running from the 19th of September until the 16th of October. The second opportunity, which is Knowledge Into Use, also uh, being uh, run by the Resilience Knowledge Coalition. Uh, knowledge Into Use awards are for innovative and creative ways of facilitating the use of resilience knowledge. And this really covers a range of different things that you can think of as creative as you can get. It could be games, cartoons, art, theater, exhibits uh, of local and indigenous knowledge or audiovisual content such as movies or songs. Um, you submit an entry and you stand the chance to win a 5000 cash prize and the intention is for you to uh, submit your idea uh, and then develop it out uh, thereafter uh, in time for an exhibition in six to eight months uh, so uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you've already implemented but rather a really creative idea uh, and submitting your entry on how it is uh, you want to put this particular uh, resilience knowledge into you uh, into use the last opportunity is another round of catalytic grants. Some of you may be familiar with catalytic grants. Uh, we've run them at CBA in the past, as well as Govershana. We'll be running a catalytic grants round uh, at the COP27 Resilience Hub. And I'll drop all of these links for, for you to get further information on the deadlines, how to submit your entries and further information. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Amil, for this wonderful opportunity for and sharing it to the CBA community. Uh, and I hope we will get a lot of uh, different ideas and a uh, lot of different uh, media content as well uh, uh, from the CBA participants we have right now as well. Uh, let's move uh, to what next with the CBA uh, and the upcoming initiatives. I request Sam. Uh, Sam, are you there? To Hi, talk thank about you, Sashira. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to just share uh, a few uh, uh, initiatives coming up that you can look out for. Uh, firstly, just to pick up on the catalytic grants that Amel just mentioned, uh, we've really enjoyed watching the catalytic grant process uh, uh, go forward on uh, uh, in previous CBAs, and this is really an open invitation um, for anybody engaged in the catalytic grant process. Uh, and particularly winners, but anybody applying to come to the next CBA and share your experience. Uh, we want to hear what you're learning. We don't want this to be something that's segmented into a different conferences box. We want to be part of this community together. So uh, we're really excited to see the catalytic grant process continue. So a few things that I wanted to, to ask for your support with um, as our CBA community. The first is we need your feedback. One of the first things that you're going to see in an email after this conference is over is a request to complete the feedback form. Now, the feedback form should not take you too long, but it really does help us think about how we run these events uh, uh, better in the future. And we would really appreciate your feedback while it's still fresh, even if it's just a few sentences of how we can improve, what we can keep, what we can get let go of. We would really appreciate uh, a little bit of time from you to help us understand how we can make CBA as good as it can po possibly be uh, in suiting the needs of this community of practice. We're also looking ahead. Uh, we are interested in setting up new uh, networking events. So uh, uh, small, uh, um, coordinating small meetings between different members of the community to get to know each other. 
nothing too intense and only for anybody that's interested, but a way that we can build stronger connections within this community of practice, which spans uh, across the globe. We're also exploring uh, uh, our impacts. And it, one thing to look out for before the end of the year is an opportunity to come and share your experiences of CBA's impact. We want to know how it is that we, as a community of practice, are influencing the discussion on community-based adaptation and locally-led adaptation. So please keep an eye out for that. You might be interested in coming to help us think through uh, uh, what impact that we've had over the last few years. And of course, I want to give a, a, a quick nod to CBA 17, which uh, uh, will take place next year. Do keep an eye out for that. We're already starting to think about what it looks like. So uh, expect to find out more information about that soon. One last thing that isn't on this slide, I want to draw your attention to the COP27 Resilience Hub. The COP27 Resilience Hub is a virtual and physical space taking place within COP uh, for advanced, collaborative, inclusive and radical action on adaptation resilience. The virtual platform has gone live and registration for the events on this virtual platform is completely free. So all the Resilience Hub events will take place at the Blue Zone at COP27, and they are hybrid events. So you can participate at COP27, uh, uh, but through the virtual platform. So the link to register, I believe, will be shared in the chat. Um, and do keep an eye out for that. It's a great opportunity. Uh, you might also be looking out for development and climate days information, and that would be the place to go and find uh, 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 more about the development and climate days this year. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand back to you, Sushila. Sushila, you're muted. Uh, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, there was a lot of opportunities, and uh, there was uh, also like the different initiatives we want to keep together and make this community a vibrant and working community throughout the year, not only on CBA. So uh, I hope you will got the link on the chat and follow it through. And now uh, let's move uh, to the highlights of this year's uh, CBA forum. So we have this live blog and we, we have this post from the live blog as well, which I want to share it out here. Uh, some from uh, Aruna Khan from founder and executive director of Friendship. We really hope that the integration of culture Adaptation solutions and local voices will be present at COP27. Similarly, from Cecilia, the leader of uh, a local group in Plaxeo, uh, who, who share a video message on we are fighting against the miners destroying the nature reserve and against the climate change. And another from also an uh, indigenous community uh, talking about we are looking at SDG 7 to make a renewable energy affordable and accessible in our indigenous communities, providing the technology and space to develop. And we had a lot of discussions around traditional and indigenous and local knowledge uh, in this CBA as well. So we do a small chat shout out and I request everyone to flood this chat box uh, through the chat shout out. Uh, so which session you feel was the most sparkling one for you and was the most uh, most influencing one for you or you have raised a lot of questions and had a wonderful discussion. So let's put that information on the chat. I request you to just open the chat and please share which session sparkled the most questions for you and which was uh, your session, which was the session that most interesting for you on this year's CBA. So we are, we are looking through the chat and we are waiting for your response. So, okay, amplifying the voices of local adapters at COP27 through the resilience of day one. Uh, somebody also mentioned the local government session today was great. Also, the session was fantastic. All sessions were fantastic, particularly the bridging the barriers to up scaling this morning, loss and damage day two, day two. Uh, local climate solution in cities, uh, climate justice sessions yesterday, 
at the loss and damage session of today. Really interesting. Right session, the Omens Climate Leadership Session, loss and damage session. It's really interesting to see this, that you are, okay, delivering NLA at a scale, local government bridging the barriers. Thank you so much for this. Now we will be joining on Menti and hearing more from you. So I request you to go to Mentimeter and use this code and somebody will drop this on chat as well. Uh, let me stop this screen and share you the Menti screen in a while. Okay, so uh, let's start with which country are you joining us from? So UK, we only get one right now. Uh, if you have trouble using the Menti, can you please check on the chat box and click the link or just type www.menti.com and use the code Five three seven four triple three seven. Okay, Uganda, UK, US, Canada, South Africa. Trinidad and Tobago. The code is 5374337. Go to the Menti and use this code. So we have from Austria, Uganda, Ghana, Ireland, India, Belgium, Zimbabwe, uh, we will wait for a few seconds. If there is any problem, just drop on the chat box if you are having problem with the mentee. Okay, we want to go to the next uh, question. And the next question will be, not one, move to the other one. So let me get back to it, just a second. Okay. So what are the key learning from the sessions you attended? So we want you, your observation, your feedbacks, and your learnings from the session you attended. So we want to capture this uh, in, in this uh, place right now. So feel free to write as many points as you wish to. If you want to elaborate, just elaborate it. And in the meantime, I just want to see if somebody also want to share their experience and key learning from the session. Uh, so is, uh, is there uh, somebody to share? Maybe uh, Susan, are you willing to share your key learnings from the session? Or Emil? Sure, Sushila, happy to share a reflection. Um, 
I think my reflection is CBA also in context of many other conferences and spaces I found myself in throughout the year, and particularly uh, the big focus on, on COP27 and the drumbeat up to COP27 itself. It's clear that local action, communities, et cetera, has really picked up a lot of traction in terms of what is being spoken about and the direction I think a lot of conversations are going. Um, this is you know, not necessarily a reflection linked to any one of the sessions at CBA, but just a personal reflection having participated and, and listened into so many valuable voices um, around LLA in practice is how do we ensure that uh, local washing, if I could uh, use that term, doesn't occur, that we stay true to what LLA um, uh, has been conceptualized for, um, and that the wording uh, has meaning to it. And something that I'm reflecting on a lot uh, in the build up to COP to ensure that uh, it isn't just an aspiration. Uh, and just looking at some of the comments that are coming through uh, on the Mentimeter is that it's clear that LLA um, is in practice, that there are solutions, et cetera. Um, but how do we also ensure that we get the appropriate finance and resources into the hands of communities to empower them for local action, etc. So more of just a general reflection after a fantastic set of sessions uh, overall, but thanks. Thanks so much, Emil. Uh, also, it was very interesting to hear yesterday, uh, I joined multiple sessions. In one session, there was a frontline worker in Bangladesh. Uh, she was a little hesitant to start with because she was telling that there is like very senior people from Bangladesh and she feel not so confident to speak up, but she was encouraged to speak up and she told us like the saline variety of uh, the rice that is introduced on Bangladesh is not so effective right now because it, uh, it's not so productive. Also, the test is not good. And so the market value is very low. Uh, so people are not having, uh, not using the saline uh, tolerant rice varieties. So she was challenging uh, us, like the technology also is uh, moving in. <laughs> we need to move on the speed. We are, we are having a, uh, this technology is not supporting the need of the local people, although it's like tolerant to the salinity, but the other things in community is not so supported, like the test of the people, the uh, the product, the cost uh, associated with production, like the amount it is produced, which is not so, uh, it, uh, not so on the mark that we are expecting on as from the technology, which also triggered a lot of uh, discussion around why uh, local consultations and uh, locally led action is needed. That was a very good example that showcased like why it should be locally led and why we need to consider and we need to push from the bottom up, not the top down approach of uh, of the work. That was a really uh, front uh, eye opener uh, session, and she was really very you know, curious on supporting the local communities, how we can do further, what we can do further. Uh, so, uh, is there anyone who wants to just uh, share uh, their key learning from the session that you attended? Uh, does somebody uh, want to speak uh, up? I would like to add some, one of my observation. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Sushila Panditji, yeah. I am a little bit old, you know, 1992 Earth Summit uh, follow-up. Probably that time you were not born even, I don't know. See, there is a popular saying that Earth Summit, words failed us. Words failed us. In climate uh, change, if not even a single penny is flowing after the Paris Convention and loss and damage, what are we doing? Why waste time? Who is responsible to question the complaints? Should these efforts become like UN and uh, WHO? Somebody passes veto somewhere and uh, the common good, public good is lost. Is it the system we want? I think uh, people at the helm of affairs should take the civic societies I want to conclude by saying that I'm also a follower of UNIDR. In 1990s, there were 76,000 nuclear warheads. Today, it's only 14,000. 
because civic societies and UN initiated public opinion. I am actually, I'm deeply disturbed when Dr. Professor Huck said in the session last and, you know, damage, a small clipping was put. When he mentioned that not even a single penny has flown from the Paris Convention to last and damage. Now, what are we talking about? Should we all waste our time? It's only a loud thinking of me, don't mistake me. Because, uh, see, I'm a old timer, 1992 till date. And we are seeing decades after decades, decades after decades. Articulation, presenting well, um, praising the community. See, community is living through since ages. Climate change is a recent origin. They have lived through the, the pandemic. They have lived through the disasters. Climate change is the recent origin. So I think this has to be seen seriously by all of us so that the civic societies, the concerned organizations come forward and question the developed world. Look, what are you doing? Are you serious? Yeah. A child like you, she sees her island being lost. Her the country is lost when she becomes a teenager. Who is responsible for it? I'm sorry, I've said uh, so many things. I yeah. hope you understand. Uh, thank you so much, Jagannath. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's, it's really very important to push this forward because as you mentioned, you are pushing it throughout your life and we are uh, the youth also pushing it through whatever the capacity we have uh, and whatever the forum we got from. Uh, we are trying to push this as far as possible and trying to build that uh, the action is needed and the action is needed just now. We can't wait long and we need the action right now. Thank you so much for highlighting this. And uh, let's go to, uh, we had a lot of this, uh, 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 sessions uh, learnings and thank you so much for putting a lot of sessions learning over here and we will move to the next question now uh, sorry for this because it is not allowing me to move to the next slide just give me a second okay so so as you as you just mentioned What we want to take it forward to the COP27, because the COP27 is the, where the policy is made, where the big negotiators discuss about it. So this is the right forum where we can capture what we all want to capture from the CBA, from the community voices, from everyone. Uh, right now, you are also speaking that we, we are talking a lot. So this is the right time. We need to frame this out, what we want to take it from the CBA and take it to the policymakers on COP27. So I request you everyone to uh, put in uh, put it what we want to take it forward from the CBA community on COP27. And if there is someone who want to talk about what need to be emerging out as a key message from this year CBA to the COP27, uh, if there is someone, I would request uh, to speak up as well when when we are doing this uh, writing on the mentees, we can speak up as well. Uh, is there someone, uh, Krish, are you there? Krish? Mm. We have a hand. Okay. Sushila. Uh, Swati. Yes. Please. Sushila. First of all, thank you so much. This was great sessions in the uh, last two days. I think one message and and which is very clear from IED and all the other research that's been done over the years is that we need to push as all the countries and you know at the national subnational level are working on the climate strategies you know revising their ndc targets and things like that um, with that top down policies we definitely need a more bottom up um, approach and and that needs to come across that it's still not enough. We are still looking at very smaller pilots. And in order to implement or scale um, these principles of LLA, which are rooted at the grassroots levels, 
um, is, is needed more than ever. And pandemic was a very good uh, eye opener for everybody to see that urban poor was disproportionately affected. Um, but there were opportunities. We saw the grassroots organizations um, were instrumental in pandemic response and a lot of cities did partner with them either in data collection or in responding. Um, you know, we heard from Philippines Federation and all of that, that new innovative ideas came across. So I think this was talked about in COP26, but this uh, in this COP, if we can highlight a lot more on the pilots that have been successful and that would need scaling up, um, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you so much, Swati. Thank you so much for your uh, very wonderful thought. And yes, uh, we are focusing on this locally led adaptation actions. And this is a key way that we are addressing uh, this issue and pushing forward as well. Uh, I can't see any more hand raised up. Is there someone or? Uh, So what do we want as a key message that we will be emerging out from the CBS 16? Swati, I would like to add one more point here. Last time I was there, uh, and this time, what I find is there is a deluge of good practices. There's a deluge of good practices. How in the urban context, LLA has reinforced the community to rise to the occasion. We need to document these good practices in local dialectic, in local dialectic, and also in local cultural forums, so that a similar groups can understand and replicate it. Point number one. Since uh, more than one year, I'm a part of WHO as an infodemic manager. I'm watching closely. Philippines or even in the Middle East, the faith-based organizations have come so much ahead to make the community respond to the pandemic. So my simple uh, request is we should take the best practices in the local dialect and make it easily available to people who cannot read and write in the cultural forum. See, then only we will be able to make a headway. Yeah. I am of the opinion what UNESCO has said in 1989, science hinges with culture. Mm -hmm. Offlet the developmental agencies of state to understand it. And uh, yeah. to me, uh, uh, CBA 16, it's a wonderful opportunity of converging all these best practices. And it's very Thank important you. and we should not miss it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jagannath. Uh, we have Ivoni. Ivoni, do you want to speak up? What is the key message? We want to take it to COP. I do. Thank you so much. I hope that you can hear me okay. I haven't got great yeah, internet yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So I'm I'm also keeping my, my camera off. Thanks so much, Sushila. Okay. And firstly, just uh, such a huge congratulations to everyone. It's been such a great couple of days of events. Um, I thought I'd just throw a, um, a slightly out of the box uh, reflection from the events that I listened into. Um, and that is that while we think through what the opportunities are for COP27 from CBA 16, that we also think about what the opportunities could be for other international forum. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about COP15, which is the UN Convention on Biodiversity's next COP, COP15, uh, which many of us will know has been deferred a couple of years because of the pandemic and it's taking place just a couple of weeks after COP27. I think one of the reflections for me this weekend through other um, events and other activities over the last couple of years on locally led action is the need to think about this in, in the, of course, the climate sense, but also what it means for, for nature and for other sectors as well. And I think there's a really strong emerging um, set of cross-cutting themes across multiple sectors. And so I think it's worth all of us thinking through what we and through our networks can do at COP27, but also at COP15 and some of the other big international forums and decision-making processes that can really push and elevate locally led action more broadly too. Thank you so much, Iboni. Uh, this was really wonderful. Yesterday, we had a talk with somebody, some researcher, maybe assisted professor from Kenya. Uh, she was also telling that people, whenever we were discussing in, in the session and she were uh, telling that people 
yeah, when whenever we go for a research, people tell that we don't know anything. They always start with we don't know anything, and then, uh, and they will know a lot of things, <laughs> regardless of they feel like they don't know anything, but in in fact, in reality, they know a lot of things. And we need we need to have like uh, there is a lot of mention about we need to have this amplified uh, the voices uh, and make them feel powerful to speak up and talk about what they really feel and what they really have the innovation and what they feel about doing differently on the communities because uh, as we mentioned it is locally led if it is locally led every community is different every setup is different. So it was really interesting to hear from all of you and give this all feedbacks and messages for the COP. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we are closing the Mentimeter. If you still feel like you want to, if you still feel like you want to ha highlight some more points, the chat box is open. Uh, you can use the chat function and uh, share about uh, your thoughts. Uh, now we are heading up to the second part of the session. We'll be having the uh, panel discussion, uh, but uh, there is a, a, a incident, a news from Bangladesh that there is a nationwide power cut up and two of our uh, panel panel members can't join. Senaz Musa, the director of, uh, sorry, Senaz Musa, uh, are you there? Uh, Dr. Salim. Yes, Mulhab. yes, I am. Yeah, I'm based in South Africa. So oh. even though we have load shedding, it, okay. yeah, it's not. Uh, I think it's yeah. Okay. I think what's uh, impacting Salim is a okay. lot worse. Sorry, sorry. It was um, yeah. uh, Dr. Salim Ulha, who who was our moderator, and uh, yeah. he is the director of International Center for Climate Change and Develop uh, Development from Bangladesh. He can't join the session. And Dr. Radha Wogli, uh, Dr. Radha, are you there? I think Dr. Radha Wogli, uh, the Joint Secretary of Ministry of Forest and Environment in Nepal, uh, was also not able to join us from. She hasn't um, been able to join. Yeah, maybe there is some issues in South Asia right now going on. Uh, we heard the news that there is a nationwide power cut from Bangladesh. So colleagues from Bangladesh could not join. Uh, and uh, our panel member, Dr. Radha Wagle, also can't join. So let me welcome uh, the director of South South North, Sehnaz Musa, and uh, the Vincent Gene, uh, the Resilience Lead, UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, to join the panel discussion with me. Uh, welcome, Sehnaz. Welcome, Vincent. Thank you, Sheila. Pleasure to join. Thank Sorry you. about our other colleagues. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm wondering if I could go and maybe just give some of my reflections. Is that okay? And just what's coming out? Yeah, sure. Uh, before doing that, uh, Sahina, uh, can you please uh, explain your, because uh, maybe some of them not, don't know you. So can you please have your brief introduction for the new participants of CBA community and then share yes. your observations? Yes, absolutely fine. So I'm Shanaz Musa, a director at a not-for-profit called South South North. We based in Cape Town, South Africa, and the main focus of our work is knowledge brokering within the climate change space. And we work only in the majority world, so the global, what people refer to as the global south. One of our big programs that's having quite a bit of impact, and we're going into the third phase now, is the Climate and Development Knowledge Network. We're going to the third phase, which is for five years, funded by the Dutch and the Canadians. And it's been running for 12 years already. And when it started off, our entry points for our work as knowledge brokers were, it was national government. And with time, we've learned that to realize impact, we need to shift our entry points to local communities and then take those voices up 
into the global spaces and then so, so similar to a loop and then feed back to the local communities, adapt the messages we're taking to the um, into the global spaces and with that impact is realized. So you know, the week before last, so we leaving the Africa component of the COP Resilience Hub. So we had quite, we had a session two weeks ago which was particularly around gathering messages to take it to the COP Resilience Hub. And so it's really heartening to see that what, what's coming out of CBA also aligns to that. And there's two really uh, dominant themes that's coming to the fore for me, and that's finance. And then also in the um, community's role but empowering that. So in terms of finance, I think what's coming across is that um, there's urgent calls for climate action, and yet we're still talking and talking, and actually time for talking is drawing to a close, and it's time for action. And, I'm, and this is a strong message that, that needs to go to the COP, and, and even though there's increasing um, recognition for locally led adaptation and the need for finances, what you hear from the communities and organizations that actually work on the front lines of your climate impacts, what they are saying is that these, the resources are not flowing down to them. And often when they're needing to respond, it was their own resources. So there's a strong call for work to be done on looking at different financing modalities that actually devolve the resources into the hands of the communities and empower them to take local adaptation action that builds resilience and actions that they deem to be appropriate. In terms of um, empowerment of the local communities, I think what's coming across very strongly came uh, through these uh, through the two days now at CBA, is that local level and and grassroots organisations as well as the communities themselves need to be recognised as partners and not just beneficiaries. So. This includes going way beyond consultation with them and extends to including local action at the heart, our actors at the heart of the decision making process. And this goes from conceptualizing ideas right through to the implementation and then even the monitoring and evaluation where that is deemed necessary. Another a challenge that's becoming very apparent is the lack of usable data. So this data, but I'm not sure how much of it is actually um, usable by communities. So although there are numerous examples of where communities are playing a crucial role in collecting, consolidating, and providing info, uh, lots of information that inform planning and policy, there's still a gap in terms of um, providing the communities themselves with data in a format that they can use to inform their climate actions. And then I think, um, and Amil put it very nicely earlier, is where we're using LLA just as a concept and we start writing papers about it, et cetera. And then we run the risk of local washing climate action. And I think we just need to be very cognizant of this and not fall into that trap. Thank you, Shushila. Back Thank you, Sehenaj. Thank you so much for this. We will come back in the discussion about more on big finance and how it is reaching to the local, uh, local communities that's most in the need of that finance rather than in, in between, we will talk to that much more. Uh, before that, uh, I would request Vincent for a quick introduction and your opinion and your key messages on this. Thank you very much. Well, it's been really great sort of um, 
listening to everybody for the last two days and being able to be part of part of this discussion. And, and um, Shanaz, thank you so much for your contribution then. The, you covered so much that's really important that came out of the last two days and we want to take forward into the future. So really, really appreciate uh, hearing that. Um, I, I work with the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, I'm a climate resilience lead. We're, um, we've been supporting the sort of the LLA approach um, as the UK for the last two and a half years, really. Um, I mean, the UK was one of the first countries to sign up to the principles for LLA at the Climate Adaptation Summit hosted by the Netherlands in January 2020, 2021. Sorry. Um, and we also have been supporting the Life AR partnership and, and the, the Life AR initiative for two and a half years now. In a way, we, we hopefully we demonstrated many of our credentials in terms of both supporting in principle, but also supporting in practice what LLA is, why it's important and how it can be delivered. And what's really important about it is that it's we feel that it's the leadership should be less with us we should be the catalyst that allows the leadership to come from the from the global south it's about enabling and catalyzing the action across for example the ldcs the least developed countries with whom we're working on the life hour initiative and giving them the the decisions giving them the 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 opportunities to take this forward at national level it's not about us as a northern donor prescribing or dictating the way forward. What I've, I suppose, in one way I've been a little disappointed because I've not seen any other donors come forward in the last few days. I've spoken at quite a few of the events, um, the, the sessions that I've attended, but it would have been really great to have heard the voices of others who've committed to the principles and said why they've committed and how they want to see them realized through the actions coming from, from um, from low income countries. Um, you know, we're still COP26 president at the moment until COP27 in Egypt next month. You know, we committed at COP26 to support and put adaptation and resilience center stage. And, and I hope we've been demonstrating how, we, how we've been doing that in the last year. But um, Shana said quite, she's quite right. It has to move from, from talking to action. That's what Egypt has said for, for COP27. They want to move from, from policy to delivery. And we're very much behind that. We totally agree with that. Um, so that's why, for example, that we are putting we are putting finances into supporting tangible, practical LLA actions through mechanisms like the, the LDC initiative. And the last couple of days, I've been hearing a lot of talk about finance and finance is absolutely critical. Enabling access to finance is going to be a real um, challenge still because the big global funds are still creating barriers that are very difficult for community-based organizations to, to get over. So we talked about um, challenges like maybe bringing together aggregations of organizations, working through intermediaries, which give opportunity to give voice to those local organizations and also will give those like the UK and other countries that are holding the purse strings, the donors, the confidence that they are able to, to allocate funding to support these mechanisms. Because I think there's still a potential lack of, trust is not the right word, but a lack of confidence in, in just handing over money, for example, to local community-based organisations and satisfying all the, the hoops and hurdles that donors require for funding. So that's a really important issue. And I think there's also, it's scaling up is important. We've also said we've got to, you know, I think among the Mentimeter said, you know, time the pilots is over. You know, we need to actually move to scale now. We've had lots of pilots over the last few years and the UK supported a number of those pilots, so have other donors. But how much do we actually need to prove further? There are key countries, Nepal, Bangladesh and Kenya came through in the last two days as countries which are really taking forward positive action in, in delivering community-based adaptation. And I think there's great opportunities to learn from them, to create communities of practice based around those countries and not led by us in the North, to create a sort of South to South peer-to-peer -peer learning platforms where they're learning from each other. So countries 
in the regions are picking up from each other and learning what works and what doesn't work rather than us controlling the knowledge flow. So I think that those communities of practice and that sort of scaling up has to come from that sort of sort of learning. There's a lot of other issues, but perhaps instead of me keeping talking for the moment, I'll hand back to you and we can then sort of take the discussion forward. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. Mr. Sheila. Thank you so much, Vincent. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we can see in the mentee and yesterday also, we had a lot of discussion about this climate finance. It's a crucial issue right now and the challenge of how to make this a locally led focused climate finance because we already have a lot of climate finance initiatives going on. But as you mentioned, the local organizations, they have the lack of access. And although we talk about millions and billions, few hundred dollars is like great money for the local community to work on. And sometimes the, this amount is not rich on the ground, on the community where, where, where it is crucially needed. Uh, I want to come back to Sahinaz. Uh, as you mentioned about now, this is the time to action and this is where we need to start the action right now. And we also talk about this loss and damage issue and the limits of the adaptation. So do you have any observation like how you, because you are recently launching this five-year program, do you have any issues? Do you have any thoughts about how you are framing it on LLA? You have talked about it, but also on loss and damage and how you are uh, moving it forward. Uh, to have this challenge of limit to adaptations as well. Yeah. Thank you, Sushila, for that question. So our approach for our five-year program is to see the eight LLA principles as a way that we implement. So we've got three, we, we call them action areas, which is finance, and we, we're not calling it climate finance because we feel all, actually all finance is climate finance. And so, so we're calling it finance because then you can touch on the private sector and how you do deals. We then, one of our other action areas is EBA and the other one is gender. And we've purposefully not gone into the loss and damage because we want to, to work via the LLA approach and bring the loss and damage in that way. So, so we, we, we chose not to make it an action area. It's also quite political. And so we, uh, our thinking is let's see how it goes and then adapt as needs be. So that's where we coming from. And, and so in summary, it is using the LLA principles as an approach to implementation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sainaj. And uh, Vincent, we are talking about this uh, climate finance and how to make it more accessible. Uh, do you have like something on thought or even uh, the community, if the donor community have some thought of doing things differently for this LLA principles on financing? Uh, because as you already mentioned, the access to finance is a challenge. So have you thought of or have you have like started thinking about doing financing differently, uh, making these, uh, um, because for financing, there are a lot of challenges and there are like protocols to reporting on the m and and all, which is like a, a very uh, concrete things that is then needed to be empowered for the community groups, community uh, uh, organizations. So have you thought it differently uh, from FCDO or from the donor community you represent uh, through? Indeed. I mean, yeah, it's a huge problem. The UK is a huge, big donor to a lot of those global funds, the GCF, the Adaptation Fund, the uh, Least Developed Countries Fund we've been contributing to in the past. We don't currently, but we have contributed significantly to it. We have a certain amount of leverage in that case with those funds as major donors to them. However, you know, there's, there's sort of key issues that I'm about ownership and about leadership. And again, what we're trying to do is enable and, and support other countries to pressure, put pressure on those funds. As a donor, yes, we, having, we have those discussions. We sit on the board of the GCF and the LDCF, um, but we, we also want to work with the countries that are most experiencing these hurdles. And that's why I've mentioned the Life AR initiative. The LDC group at UNFCCC have been really quite vocal in recent times 
about approaching the GCF and saying this isn't working for us. You know, many of our members are quite vulnerable states, um, quite fragile states, and the hurdles you're creating for them are too big for them to, to surmount. So are there other opportunities to gain, um, uh, to gain access for these countries? So, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking with colleagues, uh, including in IED, about things like enhanced direct access. So instead of getting full accreditation, you can get accreditation for uh, an umbrella sum without having to, to um, sort of a lump sum, without having to go through all the, the sort of minor hurdles of getting accreditation to get direct access. So it reduces the amount of barriers that a, uh, a country or an accredited entity has to go through whilst ensuring accountability but also delivering smaller pots of money so it doesn't deliver the very big sums that the GCF is likely to give to an accredited entity and country but it delivers project level funding which as you've said can actually be quite significant to local organizations so we're having those sort of discussions about how we can how we can get past those barriers and the UK has been also a main instigator before COP26 and we're supporting the task force and access to climate finance we're working across a range of countries now through supporting the task force on how we can ease those barriers in getting better access into countries to get climate finance to a bigger range of countries. And then we need to start working within those countries on how that climate finance then needs to be delivered to support local action. So there's two stages there. There's the countries getting their accreditation in the first place and then working within those countries on moving that down and getting the 70 or even like in Nepal's case, 80% of money flowing to, flow to local levels. So I think there's quite a lot of work in progress. There's an awful long way to go though. We mustn't kid ourselves, you know, that we, you know, we're, we're a long way along this path yet. You know, we're, we're working on this, we appreciate it, we understand this, but you know, we've got a lot of work to do and this is still ongoing. This is something that we are taking on board, we're working with, but you know, we need to work with others as well. We need, it's not just the UK in isolation. We need to work with other donors, with the World Bank, who I see is fortunately represented here today. I'd great to see um, a bank and representatives coming on, on, the, on the partners. Um, you know, these are the type of partnerships that we need to make to shift those, uh, sorry, to make those shifts in, in enabling access. Yeah, Thanks, thank you Sheila. so much. Thank you so much for this. And uh, to add on, uh, Sehna, if you want to highlight like how can we, uh, if you have an, any observation around how we can have this solution to have more access to finance for this locally led adaptation, if you want to share anything on this. I think that's a million dollar question, Sushila. And the issue I think is often around the way finance flows is um, dictated by your funders and the banks. And often the, the, they much happier giving it to big organizations that can meet all the fiduciary requirements. So I think one thing is to work with communities to capacitate them to understand how to access the funding and then how to report to it, but also then to work with the funders and the financiers and the donors to understand that which of those onerous financial management requirements do they actually need and which can they forego with the communities and based it on some sort of a trust. So it's shifting the status quo and the business as usual quite a bit. Yeah, that's my sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. And talking about COP, uh, COP this year, COP27, we have heard this uh, many different times that people, the local uh, people, they want to have their voice amplified at COP. We want them to have their voice on COP, but most of the time due to COVID as well, and uh, we have this challenge of bringing the local people on the COP and have their voice said themselves and empowering them to have their uh, voice in front of the global leaders in different ways, which is like hindered a lot. Uh, so have you seen like how we can enhance this, uh, like how we can promote more a participation of local communities, local groups, and local uh, local leaderships on the forefront in the global platforms as well. Uh, Vincent or uh, Sehnaj, uh, whoever want to pick that. 
Shall I, shall I take it first, Shanaz, and then hand over to you? Because I think you probably have more relevant things to say about that than I will. <laughs> but look, I mean, what I did hope, what I hope we saw here in Glasgow, and I, I'm based here in Glasgow, and you know, I was able to, fortunate enough to be able to attend at least one day of COP last year, was there was, you know, there was quite a strong and vibrant representation of community-based organizations in Glasgow. And we saw on the streets of Glasgow, we saw sort of demonstrations and, and displays from local organizations putting their case in front of the world and demonstrating how they wanted their voices to be heard. And, and that is really important. But in the end, you know, how much did those voices finally, how much were they represented in the final negotiations and the final deliberations? And I think they were heard and maybe they were internalized to an extent but perhaps they weren't um, perhaps they weren't really being reflected in in the final deliberations we're not cop president after the start of cop 27 egypt takes over that role and it's up really up to egypt to make sure that they're enabling the the local voices to be heard and creating the space for them you know we hope that the uk we've done an, we've done quite a bit in, in the uk in the last year to, to link in with those local voices. And certainly in the platforms that we're involved with, the sort of global LLA community of practice that we've been integral with in the last year, we've had a range of organizations have joined that and, and given us their perspective. And, and we've been able to use that to help us frame our, our way forward. But in the end, you know, as I say, you know, we're, we're handing over that presidency to Egypt and we're hoping that they will be able to create, continue to create those spaces. Shanaz, perhaps you can you can say more about that from your perspective. And I see Jagannath has got his hand up as well. Yeah, actually, I would like to chip in now. Shanaz, uh, Jag uh, Jagannath, can we uh, can we have Shanaz? Then we can come back to you. No, no, I'm yeah, happy. I'm happy. He goes first, uh, Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Madam. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say a quick response, not a detailed one. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Vincent, sir. Uh, I'm very happy. Your explanation and uh, interpretation were very good, apt. I was virtually present at Glasgow. I was representing the UNDP. And in fact, I was one of the person who gave the message to 195 countries, leaders. What should be our strategy? Let me cut short. See, what is required is in UN also, the presidential post keeps on changing on various issues. If you follow closely UN. Now the UK is going to hand over to Egypt. My question is that for the first time, see, I'm a space scientist, served 30 years in the space program. I know today the space sciences are giving pinpoint accuracy on the climate change. They are not like, uh, uh, you know, ceasefire not being followed. Pinpoint accuracy by the space sciences. What I find is in LLA, LLA, the pulsating community is rising to the occasion. And it will be very shocking to know, since Paris Agreement, not even a single penny flows for the loss and damages uh, sector. It is not a good indication. You see, uh, people at the helm of affairs like you, Vincent, sir, can really do a lot of things because hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, community uh, you know, motivators and community uh, as such are eagerly looking forward. You see, it's like uh, in 1992, we had one great leader called Anil Agarwal. Some of us made a representation in UNSAID, our summit, polluter pays principle. The polluter, if you pay the fine, I mean, uh, the liability should be there, but it has not taken place. See, we already have an unequal world. If we, if we, if we do not respond, whom, whom we should approach to? So that is the issue, that is the issue. Shehnaz and um, many, many of us are eagerly looking forward for, uh, uh, see, I remember Barbara Ward, who initiated IAED. Barbara Ward, what, she brought a message to the whole world that you should respond to the inequality, to the disparity. I think uh, the, the first world, uh, UK in particular, where my daughter is also doing her PhD now. You see, it's a global uh, uh, system we are living today. And I think uh, there has to be a little of uh, a human conscience uh, being activated. Uh, if that is not done, uh, you see, many of us and younger people will be losing heart. That should not happen. That should not happen. Is only my appeal. Uh, please don't mistake me. I'm trying to <laughs> convey something uh, in the very bottom of my heart. It's not that uh, uh, this is a great opportunity, but we should Thank never you. forget for the first time, the space sciences are giving pinpoint accuracy. 
a girl of the age of uh, Sushila Pandit, when she becomes teenager, she no longer finds her island. It is submerged. And 100 million people by 2030 are threatened. And in Bangladesh, there is no power now. A person who doesn't have a regular patta or a ownership of a land, he generates solar energy and lives by that, 15,000 rupees. So people have started finding out their own way of survival. Yeah. It's not Thank that you. the first world, the rich can only make people live longer. No. The community knows how to live longer. They are doing it for since hundreds of years. So thank you very much, sir. I'm very convinced about your, uh, Vincent, sir, your uh, interpretation. Uh, let's hope <laughs> the legacy continues in Egypt and we are uh, uh, given uh, hopes. Thank you, Jagannath ji. We haven't opened the comments yet. We are still on the panel, but you, no problem. You jumped up and you, you have a very clear point on it. We are so happy that you have a very strong point on, on it and we are happy to take that. Uh, now we want to move to our panel, Sehnaj. Uh, over to you, please. Yes, Th thank you. And actually, Sam has said there what I wanted to say, which is something that Salim always says. So often the voices are there, but it's external to the negotiations. So it's at your pavilions, it's at your hubs, etc. Um, but practically, and we see it now with uh, this COP, where we're trying to get community members to the COP, it's about passes. It's about the pricing of hotels that literally shoot up four or five hundred percent just before COP and it's the costing of flights. So there's the practical considerations as well around getting community members there. And I think when it came to the UK, the Glasgow COP, even though there was quite good representation, the visas are often an issue as well. So there's a few practical things, but then I think in terms of process is getting the negotiators out of that room that they sit in to hear the community voices. So that's, yeah. yes, that's the yeah. issue, Sheila. Yeah, thank you so much, Tehna. Even though in the Menti, we are still seeing this comment that people should have their own voices to be heard on the COP, uh, because right now, due to maybe like COVID as well, we are having these multiple hops uh, and then putting the message to the COP rather than uh, having people going to the COP, which is like reduced uh, drastically after the COVID. Uh, and and uh, people are not willing to travel as well uh, due to the fear. Uh, so uh, uh, on on that, um, I was just pointing out, yeah, how how we can move this forward. Uh, so uh, on adding to this, uh, as we talk about more about finance, uh, do you particularly think like uh, some of the issues on this CBS 16 or in particular to the COP uh, that has been missed out or that need to be highlighted? Because we are talking a lot about finance and even Jagannath right now mentioned that uh, there is need of finance, but there are other things as well. So do you have uh, any observation that uh, we need to uh, push on uh, on this locally led adaptation, not only about talking about finance, but is there any issue that you also want to highlight through, through your organization or personally through you? I, I will start with Vincent. Uh, do you feel like there need to be any other points that need to be highlighted as well? Yeah, I mean, we talk all the time about increasing the flow of adaptation finance and increasing the overall flow is really important. But there has been insufficient conversation so far at COPS and elsewhere about how that flow is then managed in country and delivered to the local level. It's too much about let's move the flow, let's get, you know, sort of put another 100 billion into adaptation finance annually. But then what happens to it? You know, we know that we know that so much of it presently, and we've heard in the last two days, you know, maybe 10% of that finance is actually reaching local level. And that conversation is not yet sort of at the kind of COP level. You know, everybody's talking about upping the upping the flow of climate finance. Nobody's talking about how to make it more effective by delivering it to local level. I'd love people like our colleagues from Nepal to come forward and give their examples about how in Nepal they're targeting 80% of climate finance to support local actions now. It would be great if they were able to stand up and say, look, it works, it can work. Our government has committed to this and this is how we're doing it and this is how we can learn from each other. 
and for the Life AR initiative, for the LDCs who've committed to that, have said that by 2030, they want to see 70% of climate finance supporting local level action, for them to have an opportunity to stand up at COP and at other venues and say, this is what we want, and this is how we are intending to deliver it. So it's, you know, it will be really good to sort of shift that conversation on just, you know, rather than just about the overall flow to actually about the use of that flow and, and in support of local actions. Now, Shanaz? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. So just picking up on the local actions and the locally led adaptations, I think currently it's via, it's quite delinked from the from the actual multilateral negotiations. And it's sitting in the non-actor space, which means it's dealing from the finance negotiations. And somehow this needs to shift. And I don't have the solution, but I think it's something that there should be momentum behind it to take it into the multi, into the negotiations and link it with the finance on adaptation uh, negotiations. Yeah. You, you rightly mentioned because as we are talking about the CBA and even the LLA, it's like more civil society driven forum and has been developed throughout the efforts of civil society and non-state actors. So moving to the uh, policy making, moving to the COP and the negotiation process is still challenging and taking the finance to the ground as uh, Vincent mentioned, the taking the finance to the ground and how it's implemented, how we channel uh, like 70%, the 80% target to the local level is the key question right now uh, as well. So thank you both of you, uh, Vincent and Sainaj, for joining us for this panel discussion. Uh, we highly appreciate your presence and your opinion on this matter. And we'd like to thank you for your time and your contribution. Thank you so much. In my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few minutes for uh, any comments uh, uh, from our uh, participants. If you want to make a statement or a comment uh, on the CBA, or if you want to have uh, your voice uh, that you want to uh, uh, take back to COP this year, uh, I would like to open the floor for uh, you. I request you to please first raise your hand and then we will let you speak on that. Uh, I will be checking the hand raise. If you want to speak up, please raise your hand and we can let you speak uh, and have your opinion heard. Mm, any comments or feedback or your observation on our key points? Uh, whatever you want to feel free, feel free to uh, raise your hand and speak about it. Uh, we have Stephen. Stephen. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. So I'm speaking on behalf of Friendship because uh, Friendship in Bangladesh, they are all under power cut, national power cut. So no one was able to join. So uh, I'm sorry if it sounds a bit uh, opportunistic, but we're all talking about bringing our message to the COP27. So I don't know. Friendship is very much open to participate in any side event in the blue zone will be there. We have messages to share. We're happy to partner with anyone here to co-organize or participate in, a, in any event. So please do invite us if you're interested in uh, also participating in one of our events. We have already, uh, for the moment, uh, three or four event sets, one in the, uh, two in the Benelux uh, pavilion. So just reach out to, to Friendship and we'll be happy to partner with you to uh, get our message, message through to, our, to the global leaders. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we are taking only one additional, if there is someone to speak, if somebody want to speak up. Okay, there is a request to visit the Resilience Hub as well. If you are on the COP, uh, is there anyone who want to share? Uh, okay, Chris. 
something that really impressed me is this concept that um, communities need to be recognized as partners, not beneficiaries. And the strange thing is, it's really hard to change the language when people are responding to calls and people want to see measurement of impact. But I think that's a really good phrase. And thanks to Shanaz for um, raising that. I think that um, we need to probably do more to explore um, how locally led adaptation um, can be used to kind of address conflict over natural resources. We only see this growing. We had a great session earlier today. I'm sorry I joined this session late. I wanted to input into the, into the messages to take forward to COP, but practical action will also be at COP. And um, I think the idea of us joining up through CBA is an excellent one. And the messaging that we'll bring out uh, as a steering committee of CBA next week and the week after will be quite important for that messaging at COP. But thanks to everyone. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and uh, so I will now like to hand over to Sam for the closing remarks, uh, and then we will uh, end the session. And thank you, everyone, for uh, being with me and uh, uh, having this wonderful conversation on two days of CBA. And I would like to leave uh, uh, with this with Sam and leave all of you. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Thank you so much, Sheila. So I'll just uh, say a, a few very quick words. Uh, it's great to see all of the comments coming in the chat. Uh, and it's really important that we recognize that CBA is not the end. Uh, the Resilience Hub is coming up, then there will be Gabeshna, and then we'll be back into the next CBA, picking up on that uh, uh, ongoing cycle. Um, I like to think that the discussions that we've had today on and, and yesterday on locally-led adaptation are the latest thinking on how to put LLA into practice, and that makes this a very exciting place to be. Uh, and all of the participants here, very exciting people to be with, um, particularly with the momentum that locally led adaptation has. Uh, I want to do a really quick plug for a couple of our own CBA spaces. There is a LinkedIn page for CBA. We also have on weadapt.org uh, the CBA network, where we're hoping to start sharing more updates for the CBA community about locally led adaptation, uh, about upcoming events, uh, and initiatives like coffee networking uh, discussions uh, or, or opportunities to feed into our mail. So keep an eye out for those and also we'll be sending emails too. Uh, I also want to share the uh, 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 link to the feedback survey. So it will come in an email. Uh, and of course, I've now promptly uh, lost where the link was. Um, I will get hold of that, share it in a moment. Um, I want to finish by just doing a few uh, uh, thank yous uh, that have made CBA possible. So IID's core team, uh, uh, IID's communications team spent a, a, a lot of time and effort broadcasting and, and blogging uh, and emailing and making sure that the messages are, are coming out. Uh, the steering group and programming group who absolutely make CBA possible. Uh, you'll have seen all of the logos on our slides uh, and a big thanks to all of the advice and guidance and steering uh, uh, and work that has gone into shaping all of the sessions. Um, another big thank you to everybody that has hosted sessions, all of the facilitators. I know it takes quite a few people to organize an online event, uh, uh, more than you would expect. Um, uh, it's not necessarily something everybody is naturally comfortable with. So uh, uh, thanks to you as well. And thank you finally to everybody for uh, uh, participating. Uh, it has been uh, uh, really fantastic to hear all the different perspectives from so many different places. And a lot of deep thinking has gone into many of the comments and the presentations that we've heard over the last couple of days. So thank you very much. Uh, this is your last opportunity to share any resources in the chat. Uh, um, what we are going to be doing now is collecting all of the messages from the rapporteurs uh, in the sessions, pulling them together uh, and sharing them out. Uh, in, in advance of COP, sharing them with our speakers, sharing with everybody we know that's going to COP, so we make those sure those messages are heard uh, and continue to be discussed in the right forums. Um, bear with me one moment while I find the link to the survey. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much for your participation. And looking forward to seeing you soon.